and she was pretty good at English. Her English was pretty fine. But she came in and she started working with me and she didn't talk to me for about three weeks. And it wasn't that I was a unfriendly boss. It wasn't that I was a difficult boss. It wasn't that her English wasn't good enough, but it was about confidence. It was about uh, having the confidence to speak and having the confidence to, to, to put your English out there. And I, you know, it, it's similar for me in terms of Cantonese. Uh, I actually find that I have to, that one of the problems for Westerners trying to learn Cantonese, having the confidence to do it. And that's sometimes more important than the language. And so I do feel that sometimes uh, one of the problems is that people can come, can go through college, can get good English marks for all their essays and can actually go into the industry and, and be pretty good when it comes to written English. But they are as nervous about speaking English as I would be about speaking Cantonese. So it, it's kind of um, an interesting thing for me. The other thing for me is that in television, of course, we have to present. We have to um, present programs ourselves. We have to get people in who can present. Um, and you know that's uh, that's uh, takes certain skills too. I also teach broadcast journalism at Chinese University, and you know one again, it's the same thing that the, the journalists have to learn how to get in front of a camera and how to go out and present. And there's a few different elements to that. One element to that is, of course. Um, your your visual appearance, how you present, how you talk to people. The other one is really how to, even how to use your voice, because as well as actually putting my students on camera and asking them to do things on camera, I actually give them specific lessons on how to develop your voice, how to make your voice uh, stronger for presentation. Now, mostly today, I'll, I'll talk more about more general terms about how to present yourself. Um, and, but, but these things sort of overlap, they sort of go around in circles. So uh, they sort of go together. Now, when I was doing the job interviews at RTHK, I used to believe that I could tell if I was gonna hire somebody in the first three minutes of the interview. Um, and I later discovered, you know, that's a common thing. It's the, the impression of the first three minutes, which is important, which affects how people perceive you and how they listen to the rest of what you say or not. Um, that's, that's sort of hugely important. And I was wrong. I was wrong because in fact, typically, People actually start to um, get an impression of you in a much shorter time than the first three minutes. They get an impression of you in the first seven seconds. And I can tell you the people I did hire and the people who did well and the people who came into RTHK and then left and went into other jobs and did well, I can remember the first seven seconds I saw them without fail. Uh, in the case of one woman who went on to work for Worldwide Fund for Nature and do other stuff, uh, in the case, I, I remember them walking into the room and sitting down and being ready to go, you know, ready to talk. And in the case of one of them, I, I saw her sitting by the lift before she even came into the interview room. And there's just a quiet assurance about her and a quiet sort of ability. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about job interviews because every presentation you make is a job interview, pretty much. That the same things apply, that you've got to actually get people's attention. You've got to let them know what kind of person you are and so on and so forth. And that's, that's your whole package. That's your whole appearance. Um, 
we have we have a joke with one of the girls I hired because I actually said to her a few times, you know, that um, she didn't have much experience in television, but she just came over in the interview as as very intelligent and very willing to talk back to us and very unintimidated by us. And again, the whole interview was in English. All these people I'm talking about were Hong Kong Chinese. Um, but it was that first impression that made me think, even though she didn't have the television experience, she would fit in well with the people in the office and she would actually um, work well there. Now, so one of, the, one of the things I want to actually say is, you know, we have this idea, I want to talk a little bit about communication theory because we have this idea that um, if you talk about communication, we have the, it's a bit difficult in this artificial um, situation, but we have this idea that communication is, okay, I shoot an arrow at you and you shoot an arrow back at me. That's communication. I send a message to you, you send a message back to me. And um, why this, is kind of wrong when it comes to communication, when it comes to job interviews, we're communicating all of the time. There's a famous uh, expert in communication called Dean Barnland. And he was actually asking, you know, what, when does a typical conversation begin? Does it begin when two people come into the room, when they first see each other, when they begin talking? Well, I kind of think it starts before that. I mean, and he, he did too. He said it begins with the ideas of the experiences, the skills, the feelings, everything you bring to the interaction. So it's very important to, to actually, when you're gonna make a presentation or when you're going to go to a job interview or whatever, don't get there late, don't get there sweaty, don't get there harassed. If you're going to get there in that, that condition, I would advise you just don't go, actually. I think that because when you walk in the room like that, you know, if you can possibly do it, arrange another day because we that really affects us. And it really is the first seven seconds. So people, the old idea, the ancient Greeks, again, believed it was like, I talk to you, you talk to me, I listen. So there's this idea of transmission and receiving. But actually, it's a much more complicated thing. Um, Barnum's ideas was what he calls the transactional or circular method of communication, that we communicate with everybody and with, with things coming back to us all at the same time. So if I'm giving a lecture to a feminist organization in Hong Kong, I'm gonna talk a certain way and present myself a certain way. If I'm giving a lecture to an organization that advocates for people with disabilities in Hong Kong, I'm gonna talk a certain way again. If I give a lecture to a group of rugby players, I'm gonna talk in quite a different way. So, and you know, the same teachers know this when they come into a classroom. Uh, luckily, students in Hong Kong are mostly quite well behaved. Um, odd, odd exceptions notwithstanding. But if when a teacher comes into a classroom and the students have all been yelling and shouting and and actually, you know, getting overexcited and the teacher can actually get an instant feedback and realize, okay, I have to up my game here. I have to actually do something to get people to pay attention. Um, so this is what we call a rich communication. This is a kind of rich form of communication because uh, every aspect of these things actually comes together. Um, let me just get hold of, I'm trying to find the particular PowerPoint I want first. Right, so in terms of communication, what we call communication richness. Now there's some interesting things about communication richness. Um, All right, so uh, let me get this open, share with you. 
So there are different levels in which we can communicate. I, I mean, I don't know if any, probably some of you write on the internet, probably some of you WhatsApp each other or signal each other or whatever. And I think one of the things you find very often is that uh, people misunderstand you very easily. Hang on a minute, sorry. The people misunderstand you very easily. And the, um, that's because writing on the internet, writing texts, writing tweets to one another is not a rich form of communication. Uh, a lot of us have got friends with whom we have a sort of sarcastic or jokey relationship. I mean, some of you probably been taught by John Chan who I've known for years and we worked together for years. So we will jokingly call each other names like you often will with your friends. Um, and you know, if, if I actually say to somebody who is an acquaintance of mine and I'm in the room with them, if I say, hey, fatso, and I'm smiling at the time, that person will realize it's not an insult as long as he thinks my smile is genuine or she thinks my smile is genuine, they will realize that's not an insult because they know me, they know my facial expressions. There's a whole level of tone of voice and everything. As you go down the levels of communication to the weaker ones, those things disappear. So the thing about presentation on stage, presentation on Zoom like this is already less rich than presentation in front of a room full of people. Maybe if, if you uh, take part in the, the uh, competition at the end of these things, you will do a presentation on Zoom. Um, but what you will be missing is, how attentive is my audience? Uh, how are they, you know, do they groan when I make that joke? Do they find that joke funny? So you miss that whole interaction. So presentation is very like that. And, you know, some of you are from the architecture school. Some of my students are from the architecture school too. Um, I noticed that when I give a present, when, when I, I studied graphic design years ago, and we have to present our ideas as a television maker, I have to present my program ideas. Uh, and it all depends on the other people in the room. What, what, how are they responding to what you do? So let me just briefly um, get this, all right, idea, this idea of information richness, because I think if you're aware of all of these aspects of uh, communication, you will think more consciously about how to use them and how necessary they are. So uh, the basic concept is the concept of information richness, that different communication mediums are rich in different ways, right? So face-to-face um, -face communication is the richest. Now, that can come down to a lot of things. If somebody, and some things we might not even want to think about, you know, if I'm in the room, I'm having a face-to-face -face communication with somebody, they may be nervous. They may be sweating nervously. Their pheromones may be actually showing that they're nervous. And if the person in the room with them will actually notice that, the person in the room with them will actually feel that. And that's something that you don't get over Zoom. It's something you don't get if you're a long distance away from people. So the next the weaker form of communication is spoken communication. Now there's two levels of this. One is like today with video, um, spoken communication, which is electronically transmitted is one thing. Um, that's already weaker than face-to-face -face communication. Uh, spoken communication just over a telephone is weaker still because you don't have my mannerisms. You don't have the ability to look at my face and see if I'm joking or whatever. The next level below that is personally addressed written communication. Uh, so I write you a memo, uh, not a memo to the whole office, but I write a memo specifically to you. And the memo actually 
is specific to you. I actually, uh, you know, I had a friend years ago. I don't know if any of you have got friends like this. That I, this friend, every Chinese, every New Year, every New Year, every Christmas, she sends a letter out to everybody. Oh, my family did this this year. My family did that this year. Uh, my son's now win, winning, winning swimming competitions. And, you know, almost everybody I know hates receiving those kind of letters because they're not personal. They're not addressed to you. They're generic. Um, and, you know, that, that affects how much people believe in it and how much they sort of can, can follow it and, and pay attention to it. And then, so the, the lowest level communication is impersonal written, written communication. Now, I've got, there are some ways in which I disagree with, with some English teachers who are purists. I'll, I'll tell you this in a second. Well, I'll tell you it now. I actually like emojis. A lot of people actually will say emojis are actually terrible, that they are damaging to the English language. That they, but no, if I say, to go back to my example with my friend, if I say, you know, what's up, fatso, and I put a smiling emoji after it, then I am actually signaling in this information poor media that it's not to be taken seriously. So a lot of the time, I think emojis are a way to make up for the poor quality of certain forms of communication. So you can actually accentuate things with the emoji. You know, if you, if you, uh, as long as you all have the same understanding of the emoji anyway. But I mean, I'm not telling you to submit student essays with emojis, but what I am actually saying is that it actually puts in, it gives a little bit more information richness to that thing. And one of the things I, I, I was taught when I was at college was, um, I, I do it quite naturally anyway. One of the things I was taught when I was at college and had to give presentation, people would say, you're art students. No, you, you, you're supposed to be expressive. You're supposed to, and we should talk with our hands. We should use our hands, you know, we, when we're talking, when we're actually doing things. Again, I think, I think that if any of you are making presentation, we, we did a, a presentation competition about four or five months ago, maybe, yeah, about four or five months ago, and it was secondary school students. And uh, I'll probably come back to this in the next lesson. Uh, so we have a big lecture theater downstairs at Drew High College, and the students had to stand at the front of that lecture theater and give a speech out to the audience. Because of the size of the lecture theater, um, it's very hard to project your voice all the way back uh, to the back of the room. Uh, but every, so every single student, pretty much every single student, we had a microphone there with them. And some of the teachers in your classrooms will use a microphone. I never use a microphone in my classroom. Um, but some of the teachers will, will like to use microphone. Uh, every single student except one used a microphone. And once you're using a microphone and you're trying to remember your text, your range of movement and your range of motion is very limited. Your range of expression is very limited. So again, if you want to, my advice is, uh, if it's at all possible, and in a situation where you have any control, if you have to use a microphone, get a clip on microphone. Um, but otherwise, learn to project your voice to the back of the room. Because if you can do that, then you can actually get to use your hands. And I told you, every student who came to that speech competition used the microphone except one. As it turned out, that one was the winner of the speech competition because she'd actually had the ability to, to sort of talk and to, to, to be expressive, to use her hands, to use her whole physical presentation. 
So face to face is the richest. We got verbal signs. We've got nonverbal signs. You know, if you're trying to if you're trying to impress somebody in a party or a bar, you know, you 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 these signs can be quite important. Um, you get instant feedback. You know, when you're actually working in a in an organization, we have this thing called management by wandering around where you go out and you walk around everybody's desks and you talk to them. Um, we get a lot of this with video conferences, but we don't get all of it. This is quite important. We don't get all of it. Even when people are not too shy to open their cameras, um, you still don't get all of it. And, you know, so spec spoken communication is the next one. Now, this can be rich because you can use your tone of voice. Uh, you can use your emphasis, you can give feedback, but there's no visual cues. When you are actually giving presentations to people in public, when you're presenting yourself, you should be using your tone of voice again. I worked with the person uh, years ago who suffered from depression. And this isn't true of everybody with depression. Depression can be a dangerous thing because some people who are depressed uh, seem cheerful and seem very active. But this person with depression, his whole demeanor was like very down and very undemonstrative and very, and you know, th this comes over even in your voice, even if you're not doing it uh, in, in a room with people. So it's good to learn how to modulate your voice and how to use your voice and and I'll actually talk a bit more about that later um, it took me a long time to learn how to do it because I came in I, I, I was used to making television from behind the camera then I discovered I had to get in front of the camera sometimes and I had to teach myself this voice variation this this way of actually getting more sort of power into just using my voice so Think about how to use your voice in your, your speech. Um, like I said, personally address written communication directly to the person, directly chatting to that person. That at least seems to be paying attention. Um, there's no instant feedback. Uh, there, are some, there are times when somebody doesn't like what you've written to them. I've seen this in, in or organizations in an RTHK, if people don't like what you're at, if you say, oh, could you uh, do this? Can you arrange to go there on this Monday and you do this? And you just get back a one word reply, noted. That actually tells you that person is not happy about what you've just asked them to do. Um, unless their communication uh, skills are very, very poor. Um, you know, when, when you've got to be, extra specially careful with, in those circumstances and with those kind of things uh, to, um, to get the idea over and to do things. Uh, and that, so, so it's even worse when the communication is not actually, uh, not actually a, um, a personal communication or something very strong. So one of the first things is, you know, how to get into this situation, um, how to actually communicate these things. So I want to come back to the job thing again. Now, it might seem strange I'm talking about jobs here, but I'm talking about this because an ex-girlfriend of mine was a, is a, is a dancer um, and a choreographer and she put stage things together. Now, most of us are hoping that in our life we will get out of college and we will go for a job interview and we'll wow them so much. We'll have that job and it'll be great and we'll do it for the rest of our lives. But for people like artists, for people like designers, for people uh, who do these kind of things, firstly, most of your jobs are freelance jobs. You have to make them yourself out of nowhere. And you have to persuade people. If you want to be a film director, you've got to go to people and you've got to say, can you give me, uh, can you give me 10 million Hong Kong dollars so I can make this film? 
uh, you've got to, you have to initiate that. My friend who was a dancer choreographer, she has to go to the Arts Development Council on this place and that place and say, oh, can you actually, um, you know, can I, this is the dance I have in mind. This is what I have in mind. This is how long we were thinking. So you have to make that presentation. And every single job, which lasts for about three months at a time, has to be presented to somebody. Most of us don't want to do this ever, but it's actually quite important to, to know how to do this and to actually be willing to do this on a, a sort of ongoing basis. So I know, I've given you, given you the wrong picture now. So just a little bit about, this applies to if you're giving a public presentation or a public speech, as well as uh, if you're trying to impress people, if you're trying to actually get the whole thing together. Um, like I said, you have got seven seconds. If you do give a really bad impression in that first seven seconds, it's really, really, really hard to undo it and to make it work better. I actually was going to do something today. I, I've always thought about this. I've always thought, okay, maybe I should start this lecture um, or this presentation with a bit of video of myself, you know, looking scruffy with, with my unshaven, wearing an old T-shirt, which I tend to do at weekends, just generally looking unprepossessing. I often say to myself, you should start your presentation like that. And then you should come on and present it dressed properly as you would to talk to students or to be a teacher. And I always chicken out. I always chicken out because I think if I do that for the first seven seconds, even when I come back with my shirt on looking tidier and, and neater, you're still going to think he's hopeless. And you know, this, this is really true. This is really the case. There are cases where people have lost jobs because they've been rude to somebody on the ground floor of a company building. You know, this is a, this is a simple fact of life. You never know who you're talking to. So again, I want to come in. You've got seven seconds. Look assured, look strong. Um, and again, it's the same on stage. When you come on the stage, if you look terrified, uh, people will know it. So the interview, it, it begins early. It begun, begins long before you come in. You've got to, long before you talk to people. I was actually talking to uh, an ex-employee of mine the other day. I had coffee with her and she's still working around Hong Kong. And I said, you know, uh, I could tell I was going to hire you and Hannah, the other person, again, in the first few minutes of the conversation, because, because she had this confidence, you know, and she didn't necessarily know this. So get there early, turn your phone off. That's really important. Uh, of course, if you're gonna do a presentation, that's even more important. Look around you, get an idea of the, 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 the place around you. Like I said, one of the women I hired was just sitting by the lift waiting for the interviews to start, and she was impressive already. So, you know, here's an example that, that uh, people actually, of people, if you are being a pain before the interview even starts, you know, it doesn't help once you get into the office. Again, this, this doesn't really relate that much to presentation, but again, it relates to the fact, get your act together quickly before the thing. So treat everyone you meet on the way in as your interviewer for the office job uh, or for your presentation too. Actually, if you're presenting designs or something to somebody, I mean, we're, we're talking about different kinds of presentation here. There's, there's the on-stage presentation where I give a TED talk kind of thing. But if I'm actually presenting my work to people, um, I have to uh, do this well. The other thing is, you know, if you, um, even if you're working in the same office, in, in RTHK, we would actually send people off on training courses and they come back from the training course 
and then the director of broadcasting in those days would say to them, okay, can you give us all a, um, a reminder? Can you give us all a sort of pricey of the course? And if they come in and they're sort of going, uh, yeah, yeah, um, you know, they've blown it. They've actually blown the presentation. So whatever kind of presentation you're doing, try and get to be more organized and more sort of uh, ready to present yourself in, in a sort of believable way. So that's quite important. So um, again, this is a story from somebody in a company who said, you know, he went down, he was actually going to chat to people and that person was actually very rude to them because that person thought they must be menial in the company. Well, I can tell you there's two things that will get people fired from me by me is one of them is if you treat underlings badly and the other one is if you lie to me and I catch you lying. I find it very, very hard to uh, forgive that and work with that. So strong first impression, go in. Wear the right clothes. Now, this is again, um, again for a job job presentation. You go in, you shake hands, you make eye contact. Uh, don't make too creepy eye contact, but wear the right clothes. You know, I've I've interviewed Hollywood stars. I've interviewed the old governor of Hong Kong. I've interviewed far pig farmers in the new territories. I've interviewed street sleepers. You, you have to match the person. You have to match the situation. We had a horrible woman working for us at one point who wasn't hired by me, who wanted clothes sponsorship for her clothes. She wanted you know, her clothes to be uh, sponsored by Gaultier so that we could actually, she could look good. And I said, look, you know, you're going to go out and interview a pig farmer next week. You can't go traipsing through the new territories in Gaultier and expect anybody to take you seriously. Um, you've got to be much more able to deal with the situation than that. You don't want to make people think you are way above them. When the BBC started, BBC did this a lot, um, which was very disappointing. When I look at old English television programs, the BBC presenters in that time were very middle class and um, all the university graduates, you know, and they, so they go out and they'd have a microphone in their hand and they say, oh, tell me, what's it like to be poor? <laughs> and, and we look at that today and that's totally embarrassing. You, you really will not condescend to people to that degree these days, but you know, when you're actually going to impress people or deal with people, you've got to fit them. You've got to fit the situation. Um, so again, uh, this is not quite a relevant one. This was about don't have, well, don't have sweaty hands, but don't have icy cold hands either. <laughs> it's not a good thing, try and avoid that. If there's small talk for the interview, um, then uh, try and think about it. If you, you know, try and get things to work. Now, small talk, even on a stage presentation, works very effectively. A presentation is not you standing on a stage shooting arrows out at the audience. Sometimes you ask a rhetorical question. When you ask a rhetorical question, um, you're not expecting an answer, but it gives, makes the audience think make the audience sort of come back a little bit. Um, and again, you know, if people come, the thing that often happened with us is we say, why, why do you want to work with the company? Or what of our programs have you seen? And people will come back, they don't have an answer. They don't really know what to do. So, you know, one of the other things we've done in, in RTHK before, uh, and in also in sort of media training, we're asked to train company bosses and executives how to come in and how to talk to people and how to be casual. Now that we had, we used to have a guy in Hong Kong uh, who before, long before 1997, I came here in the 19, late 70s, early 80s, we, most of our 
government officials in those days were your typical old fashioned British colonialists. You know, many of them had been colonialists in India before they came to Hong Kong to be colonialists. They always wore ties, they always wear suits. They always, there was one guy, a guy called Dennis Bray, who eventually became Sir Dennis Bray. Every time he came into our student, he would studio, he would come in dressed casual. So when we were interviewing those, those guys in the suits, it was easy for us to, in a way, undermine them because they just looked so out of touch with everything. But Dennis Bray used to come in and he'd be wearing a sweater, you know, and he'd be casual and he'd be, have an open neck shirt. And he instantly got more sympathy from people. And it's actually quite important to, to, to handle that, you know, to deal with that in that way, to be able to uh, put people at their ease and to make people think you're at your ease. I don't want to go through all of these. So, like I said, the first six seconds, six in 10 managers say the dress code is important. Again, this is important when you're doing a presentation. Um, now, let's come back out to the presentation things a little bit. I want to show you something. One of the things about pre presenting, and Gaspar's seen this before, if he's still here. Um, one of the things about presenting is people are terrified of it. Uh, I was terrified the first time I walked into a classroom and the first time I walk into a classroom uh, after years of doing television and all kinds of things. The first time I walked into a classroom, it was a very big classroom. I had 30 students, which seems almost unheard of. Then this was at July College in our old place. I had 30 students to teach leadership to. And yeah, it's kind of terrifying. You know, you just think, okay, I wish the floor would, would open up you just what are you most scared of in terms of presenting the best way to get over whatever you're scared of is to you know is to um hang on let me get this try and get this open. and next tonight something all right i'll give you a bit of advice i mean i'll get more into this thing later but what people what it happened a few times during our school uh, competition that people had come in they'd rehearsed their entire five minutes of speech for the presentation and they came in and sort of three and a half minutes into it they forgot the next sentence and I was I'm sure they were in agony because I was in agony watching them and rooting for them and you know scared they were going to have a heart attack or something because they were petrified, they were terrified. And this has happened to me. I've actually been on the radio since about 19, late 70s, early 80s. I've been on television since then. One period, suddenly, I suddenly dried up. I suddenly got really nervous. I suddenly totally got, you know, messed everything up. And I had to go into the studio every week because I was doing film reviews for the radio. And I had to go in every week on radio. And every time I went into the studio, I was thinking, I'm going to do this again. I'm going to mess up again. And my heart would start beating too fast and I wouldn't be able to catch my breath. Let me show you what that looks like. Not with me, but um, uh, a well-known American TV presenter. And next tonight, something different. Imagine millions of people watch your life come unglued, an all-out panic attack on TV. It happened to our Dan Harris, but his journey of discovery brought back some lessons for all of us about our lives, too, and he's telling us about it tonight, Dan. Hi, Dan. This is a very personal story, as you know, because you were right there when it all started. Sometimes there are things holding us back from being happy, and we're not aware of it until life hits us over the head with a frying pan. And that is what happened to me. From ABC News, this is Good Morning America. Welcome to the most embarrassing day of my life. We're gonna go now to uh, Dan Harris, who's at the news desk, Dan. Good morning, Charlie and Diane, thank you. This Welcome. is me 10 years ago. And the reason this is the most embarrassing day of my life is not that it looks like I've been attacked by a blow dryer and a can of hairspray. 
No, it's that I am about to freak out on national television. Health news now, one of the world's most commonly prescribed medications may be providing a big bonus. Researchers report people who take cholesterol-lowering drugs called statins for at least five years may also lower their risk for cancer, but it's too early to, to prescribe statins slowly for cancer production. At this point, I realize I'm helpless, so I bail right in the middle. Uh, that does it for news. We're gonna go back now to Robin and Charlie. All right, thanks very much, Dan Harris at the news desk with some of the headlines of the morning. Want to go to Tony Perkins now. He is Once the fear subsided, humiliation rushed in. I knew with rock solid certainty that I had just had a panic attack on national television. So why would I tell you this very embarrassing story? Because that on-air meltdown was the culmination of something that had been building for years, something I never stopped to address. It's something we all battle, whether we have panic attacks or not. Call it the voice in your head. That's where I feel stress. It's the inner narrator that can control us. Highly critical. Get in the way of living the life we want to lead. For Brian Simmons, it was outbursts of anger. I would act very reactively. Very for Becky Schmitz, it was emotional eating. Eating was like my security blanket. And for a young Dr. Mehmet Oz, it was a racing mind that kept him from focusing on one thing at a time. For me, a saying a voice in the head is too benign an expression of what really happens. That massive cacophony that we hear, deafeningly loud. Does it surprise you at all how much time we all spend fixating on these self-defeating voices we hear? I have always been surprised how much time we spend wasting on the voices in our head telling us we're not good enough. In my case, like many Americans, my inner voice was pushing me to succeed. Annual New Year's party in New York. This is me in my late 20s. Thank you, Dan. Dan Harris. I had my dream job, but I also had doubts about whether I was good enough. But it's hard to do that. All right, I'm going to try it. Three, two, one. My solution? Become a workaholic. After 9-11, I volunteered to spend years in war zones where I covered the heroics of our men and women overseas and got a real taste of both the horror and the adrenaline of combat. After years of always barreling forward, when I finally slowed down, it was as if my mind revolted and I got depressed. And so in my free time, I briefly but stupidly began self-medicating. And it was those recreational drugs, my doctor would later tell me, that almost certainly produced the on-air panic attack. Um, I'm not going to, we don't need to see the whole thing. Basically, he goes on to say that, you know, he dealt with this through um, meditation, through mindful meditation, which it works. I can tell you it works. Um, but you know, that's, that's, that's our worst nightmare. That's what we're really scared of in terms of what if I'm doing this speech? You know, we, we tend to think of uh, the audience as being antagonistic, whereas mostly it's not. Mostly the audience is on our side, actually. And like I was on the side of those students that were drying up and forgetting their life. You're not actually, and you know, unless you're political rivals or you hate, unless it's Donald Trump and you hate Donald Trump, then, then you're mostly not going to be so negative to people. So you can always relax. You can always sort of let people um, have some sympathy for you. It's very common, you know, one of the forms of public speaking, which none of us really want to have to do ever. And I've chicken out doing it several times, is give a eulogy at a funeral, uh, a eulogy of somebody we cared about or somebody close to us. So what tends to happen is these days, they tend to have an officiant who comes in. If it's not a religious funeral, they tend to have a person who comes in and gives a potted history of that person's life. Um, and, you know, when I've had this kind of thing in my family to deal with, I just thought I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't stand up. I would get too emotional. I would burst into tears. I wouldn't be able to finish it. I wouldn't be able to go on. Probably is true, but I don't think everybody would think I was a failure if I couldn't go on or if I couldn't do it. The thing about these, these sort of um, panic attacks, the thing about this situation we dread is it doesn't matter 
how experienced you are. And it doesn't matter how practiced you are. Laurence Olivier, who was one of considered maybe Britain's greatest Shakespearean actor by that stage in his career, suddenly got stage fright so bad, he couldn't actually get himself out from behind the curtains and get onto the middle of the stage. And you know, if he's gonna get stage fright, we all can. But I wanna give you one piece of advice because I've, I have learned, I did eventually learn how to deal with this problem and, and it will be good for you. Now, again, if you do a presentation for this thing and if we're doing it on Zoom, you're not gonna have this problem. But if you're presenting to clients, you are sometimes gonna find yourself losing your breath. You're gonna find your, your heart beating in your head. You're gonna think you can't, you, you're gonna faint any second. You're probably not. Uh, I don't think people often do. But one piece of advice I give you is before any kind of presentation, if you're doing a five minute live presentation, Mindfulness is good. If you can meditate for a little bit, that's good. But the most important thing is hyperventilate. Uh, those, those people who came in and gave a, a, a presentation to us, I'm sure they were totally freaked out. But the, the worst thing is the feeling of not being able to catch your breath. If you hyperventilate, if you over-oxygenate your blood before you start, that feeling of not catching your breath would never occur. This is really important. So again, watch this again. I want you to watch this and watch his breathing and you will see what is the problem here. ABC News, this is Good Morning America. Welcome to the most embarrassing day of my life. Now to Dan Harris. I'll turn the sound down a bit. Morning, Charlie and Diane. Thank you. This is me 10 years ago. And the reason this is the most embarrassing day of my life is not that it looks like I've been attacked by a blow dryer and a can of hairspray. No, it's that I am about to freak out on national television. Health news now, one of the world's most commonly prescribed medications. Watch how often he takes a breath. Patients may be providing a big bonus. Breath. Researchers report people breath. who take cholesterol lowering drugs called statins breath. for at least five years may breath. also lower their risk for cancer, but it's too early to, to prescribe statins slowly for cancer production. At this point, I realize This is one of the problems of this kind of anxiety attack, this kind of panic attack. You're breathing very shallowly. And in fact, it's not, you think it's that you're not breathing in enough air. Actually, it's that you're not breathing out enough air. You can't breathe in a lot of new air until you breathe out. So uh, this kind of very shallow breathing it actually is very damaging for you in, in that sense, that it, um, it makes you feel like you're just not getting enough air into your body. So I always, these days, eventually I got over my own problem with radio, doing this with radio, just by making sure I can actually inhale and exhale and get a lot of blood into my, my blood, uh, oxygen into my bloodstream. Those people who go underwater and dive to incredible depths with no oxygen tank. That's what they do. They do 16 minutes of deep breathing before they even get into the water. And you know, that, that means that you're, you're not gonna run out of breath during your interview. If you don't run out of breath during your presentation, you're not gonna panic. And if you don't panic, um, you're going to do okay. You're not going to be able to keep on. I want to show you also a, um, a funeral thing. I mean, I say, you know, most of us wouldn't want to do a funeral eulogy. Now, one of the things about communication, about giving a speech, is not only about you and your expertise, it's about the other people in the room. So this is a guy in Britain. There may be a swear word in this, I can't remember, but it's, uh, I, I, I didn't, okay. This is a famous act, comedian on British TV who worked with these people. Um, and they had a memorial service with him and they asked his friends to give funeral eulogies. And this is the, the funeral eulogy they did.
Graham Chapman, co-author of the Parrot Sketch, is no more. He has ceased to be. The rest of life, he rests in peace. He's kicked the bucket, popped the twig, bit the dust, snuffed it, breathed his last, and gone to meet the great head of light entertainment in the sky. And I guess that we're all thinking how sad it is that a man of such talent, of such capability for kindness, of such unusual intelligence, should now so suddenly be spirited away at the age of only 48, before he achieves many of the things of which he was capable, and before he'd had enough fun. Well, I feel that I should say not good riddance to him, the freeloading bastard I heard he said. <laughs> and the reason I feel I should say this is he would never forgive me if I didn't, if I throw, throw away this glorious opportunity to shock you all on his behalf. <laughs> Anything for him but mindless good taste. I could hear him whispering in my ear last night as I was writing this, all right, please, he was saying, you're very proud of being the very first person ever to say shit on British television. If this service is really good, just for starters, I want you to become the first person ever at a British memorial service to say fuck. <laughs> Until Graham's death. Now, just now, you know, I did say the point of communication is you got to know your audience. Um, it's very important to be aware who your audience is. If this was most other kinds of funeral for most other kinds of people with most other kinds of audience, you wouldn't be this irreverent. Well, I mean, it is true. People, people do find themselves uh, laughing a lot at funerals. They don't think they should, but they do. Um, and this gets to be, uh, you know, you, you try and cover it. In fact, usually at the wake after the funeral, uh, people drink a lot and then they're, they're quite cheerful. They're quite okay. So this is one of the things which you, you can sort of do, one of the things you can think about when you're doing these things. Um, you know, there's this. There are situations where you can use these, where you can go against expectations. Um, so uh, let me come back to a little bit about about public speaking in general. General, one of the other things which we got to talk about, which I'll talk about more in the second lecture here, is the idea that there are different kinds of public speaking. I mean, there's a memorial like this. You might have to stand up at a wedding and uh, be the best man and talk, make jokes about the bride and groom. You might have to stand up in front of people in your office and sell an idea or defend your department. You might have to, if you wanna go into politics, you might actually have to stand up in front of people. And in that context, the really important thing would be to do a speech with a call to action. How do I actually um, end my speech with a call to action? So people will go out and, you know, vote or protest or give money if it's a charity or do whatever. So all these are different kinds of speeches. They, and they rely on different kind of things and different kind of ways of doing things. Um, another key thing about a lot of speeches is, is never underestimate the, the power of story. Even, people don't always even realize they're doing it, but even people who don't realize they're putting stories into their speeches very often do. Um, and we'll see some more examples of that later. So let's get, let's get back to um, this. I want to get this one open. OK, so public speaking. Um, basically, 
we can sort of split this into four areas. I've already talked a bit about elements of speech communication, but one of the key things which we have, we can actually do, which we can talk about. So there are all these kind of situations where you might be asked to speak in this sort of thing. You might, even if for, a lot of us are seeing friends leaving town at the moment, you know, you might actually want to give a speech at one of their dinners. Um, you might be asked to do these things. You might want to be a lawyer. And if you want to be an architect or a designer, yes, you have to sell your thing in the workplace. You might want to be a lawyer, in which case being able to stand up in front of a courtroom and argue coherently and make your points clearly is important. Um, you know, and those things are kind of quite key. These are, they've done things where they've actually asked, hang on, I'm jumping forward too much. So, you know, people are scared of it. People are quite rightly scared of it. Now, I told you I was scared of it sometime. I told you I had problems at the time. Um, but don't forget, I was speaking in my first language. One of the reasons I was so kind to so many of the students who came and talked to us last time is they were all standing up and speaking in their second language. I wouldn't even begin to have the nerve to speak in my second language. So I'm always, I always think this is quite important. So you can get your personal development, you can boost your personal development. You know, public speaking engagements in a lot of workplaces, you will actually find. I used to get people call me up and say, oh, could you come and give a lunchtime talk about working in television? Or could you come and do this? Could you come and do that? Um, and so I used to do that. You know, some people do it. They get paid for it. We didn't because we're working for a government organization. One of the best people I have ever known for being able to do this kind of thing was former governor Chris Patton, because Chris Patton could actually sit down. His governor addresses the first one or two, which I helped him film, um, he had scripts but after a while he had no script at all he could just sit down and do the five minute thing not you know off the top of his head he didn't learn it he just had an idea what he wanted to say and he would come out and he would do it he, he was brilliant at that actually whatever you think of political issues he was really really good at that um so you can boost your confidence you can learn how to improve your speaking, how to do things. Um, speaking in public, whether you're doing TED Talks, a lot of people are using TED Talks as a form of um, career advancement these days, which is fair enough, actually. You know, you can do that. So they've asked people, what are they most scared of? You know, I, I'm, I'm pretty scared of heights, I must say. Heights is quite high on mine, but actually, public speaking is on that list for almost everybody. A lot of people really, really dread that, you know. So what, why are people scared of it? You know, they're scared because they think the audience will judge them very harshly, that their insecurities will be exposed, they'll make a mistake, uh, they may stutter, they may stammer, they may do something, they may be perfectionist and they may not want to do something unless they can be seen as being perfect. They may be afraid of being rejected or being booed by people. They may be afraid of failure, not getting the idea across or not doing a successful speech. But people are really are quite scared of, of speaking in public, you know. And the, this American comedian, Jerry Seinfeld, said people are so scared of um, speaking in public, they'd actually rather be in the coffin at a funeral and giving a speech at the funeral. And I think is quite true for some people. You get used to it eventually, you know. So again, I'm not sure yet uh, the grounds of this. If you've got things which you're doing, you can actually make, improve your chances of doing this well. You know, you can actually pick the topic you like. If, you, if there is a choice, even if the topic is set for you, find an angle that works for you and that makes it interesting. Um, plan the event if you can, 
uh, if you're doing it in a big auditorium, go to the auditorium first, take a look and see, um, get comfortable with the room. If you can, look at the microphone. Uh, if you have to use a microphone, try not to use a, a hand mic, as I said before, prepare everything. PowerPoints, <clears throat> one of the, the things with us teachers, particularly teachers of English as a second language, we put too many words on our PowerPoints a lot of the time, uh, but we do that because we know it's at English as a second language and you actually have got to spend time looking at words. Um, I have, I've had one class where I've had Korean students who could barely understand an English sentence, so they needed the words there. But generally, PowerPoints are for emphasis. What you should never ever do is basically put up a PowerPoint and read your PowerPoint for the script. Never actually sort of stand there and say, point one, pick a topic you like. If you have a point two, spend time planning. You, you, you don't do that. This is very bad. Learn how to recover when something goes wrong. When those, those students who came in um, forgot the words they'd actually read, they should have had something ready. They should have been able to jump onto something until the thought came back to them. Don't be so rigid that you've got to read out every full stop and get every word right all the way through. Work to eliminate ticks, whether that is um, verbal ticks, whether it's ums and ers, which I do a bit too much, I suspect. Um, <coughs> but the other thing is, when you're in a situation of tension, you tend to pick up verbal ticks. I was on the radio one time, I was talking about film reviews. And for some reason, I was talking about films, for some reason, I got into the habit of saying, actually. And then I notice a lot of Cantonese speakers do this too. When we actually interview people for our programs, you have like five sentences in a row that begin, and I was doing that in my, my review, not in Cantonese, I was doing it in English. I was actually this, actually that. When I came out of the studio afterwards, I said, to one of my co-presenters, I think I said actually a lot in that in that interview. And he said, oh, did you? Actually, I didn't notice. I went, counted it afterwards. The interview was about six or seven minutes. And I'd said actually 18 times in six or seven minutes. So you've got to be careful. Don't get flustered and don't actually, don't actually, don't, don't do that. Try not to do that. Be aware of it, be aware of the problem of this. And if you've got certain verbal tics, learn to control them. You can do it. I mean, if I'm very relaxed sometimes and I'm talking, I get repetitive, I get difficult, but other times, um, you know, I can control it. I can find ways to control it. Don't talk in a monotone. I'll get onto this again more later. Practice before you do your thing. Again, don't, don't just think, okay, I have this vague idea for something I can do, so I'll wing it. Don't. Um, make sure you're practiced enough to do it properly. Dress appropriately. We said about this in the job situation. Be careful. Don't drink too much coffee. Uh, it, it will make some... If you're really tired and you need to wake up, you can. Um, but if you're the kind of person it makes jumpy, then don't don't do it. Uh, you know, don't drink too many Red Bulls either, because I've known people who virtually survive on Red Bulls through most of the day. And it's not a good idea, particularly if you think you might have a panic attack, I can tell you a Red Bull is going to make it more likely. Eye contact, have eye contact with people. Humor is almost always good. I mean, this is an important thing. Humor almost always good. Uh, I like stand-up comedians. I like good stand-up comedians a lot because good stand-up comedians are so um, brilliant at giving us serious messages. And you know, if you're if you're anxious, come over this. I want to show you a. Um, let me show you one um, stand-up. I like 
uh, you know, a lot of comedians, they take, they take, they make very- Recently, I had a police officer. They take very serious points in very funny ways, but James A. Caster, this, this British comedian is one of my favorites. And I think he's very good at this kind of thing. Recently, I had a police officer explain witness protection to me. You don't need to know why. <laughs> So James, when someone goes into witness protection, he or she is given a new identity, and he or she is relocated, and he or she spends the rest of their life under government protection. I like the way he put it. I like people saying he or she. Because he or she is only ever said by men who are fully intended on just saying he. <laughs> At the very last second, remember that she exists. <laughs> so it's always said, he or she. <laughs> There's a panic in their voice. No one's accused them of anything yet. Or she. I didn't even say they couldn't. I've got another one next word. I've got nothing on me. Or she. <laughs> Women never say he or she. Women use a different word. Men don't even know this word. It's confusing and disorientating to men. Women say, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, they. <laughs> Ninety-nine percent of men have no idea what they means. Never one percent think it means he. It's a confusing <laughs> word. <laughs> Says his police officer, "What's your problem, man? Explaining witness protection to me. Never heard the word they before." It was like, "Oh, fine, sorry." If someone goes into witness protection, they or she. <laughs> Sneaky cop. <laughs> you can make quite, you know, there's a good point there about sexism in language. And, and, uh, and it's something that as teachers we have to be aware of, particularly as male teachers, I think, that most, a lot of the books which I've actually used to teach from or, or learn from in the past about leadership, for example, they do gravitate, they do default to he for everything. And it, it's something you have to think about. So I have to talk about, you know, so executives, you know, male or female, or even these days, because I actually have had some students who are, are trans or, or do not want to be classified as male or female. You've got to be, they works very well, actually, is worth trying. But, but you know, you can use the humor. The humor is a good way to do it. Look how casual he looks. Now uh, there's, there's, um, there's a, an organization called Toastmasters, which teaches people to give speeches. And actually Toastmasters International, it tends not to be English people. It tends to be a lot of people from other places, um, from India, from countries with English as a second language. Uh, and they, they teach people to do this in quite a contrived way, actually. Um, which, uh, again, we'll see a bit more of this next time. I really don't want to start showing this now because we can carry on talking about other things first for the month. So, you know, think about timing, um, be ready, you know, and, and sort of get, get everything ready to do it. Now, Toastmasters International, as I said, if you're, if you're um, I think they tend to be too gimmicky sometimes. You can find lots of things explaining how to do public speaking on the internet too. You can uh, read books about it. Uh, you can have a coach. We actually sometimes are paid to go in and coach government officials or coach uh, CEOs of companies how to do this. This is all quite kind of quite important. Why it's good for you to learn how to do this. Public speaking can be a boost for your self-esteem. It really, you might be scared of being booed off the stage, but you feel really good when you're not, you know. You can make good contacts at these kind of events. You may want to push a point of view. I mean, I, I tend to proselytize quite a lot about um, things like COVID and the fact that I think people should get vaccinated and wear masks. I can actually do that on a public platform. Money. Money is a good reason for doing public speaking. People will often pay you. Now, if you are famous enough, uh, they pay you a lot. 
Donald Trump, even in 2006, was earning 1.5 million US dollars for one speech. Ronald Reagan used to get 2 million for a tour of Japan with two speeches. Tony Blair, former British Prime Minister, half a million US dollars for a short speech in Guangdong province. You know, so it can be lucrative to be able to speak. Um, I'm, I don't want to use this one yet. I don't really want to get into um, the history at the moment. So it's a way to show off yourself. If you uh, are very prone to uh, advancing your career already, you may well have signed up to LinkedIn. I don't like LinkedIn very much. I mean, I'm on it, but I don't tend to like it very much as a way of promoting yourself because it always makes people's self-promotion look too obvious. Um, and that's kind of quite important. Uh, it kind of not very, very good for me. Um, so communication goes with leadership. If you can communicate people, if you can stand up in front of people, people will think you are worthy of being a leader. They're not gonna think that the best you can do in the office is make the coffee if you're actually very good at, at these kind of things. How can you do this? How can you actually make these things? I wonder when one British woman, one British reporter called Carol Kudwalada, she did a lot of research into how Russia was using, was using Facebook to achieve its political ends. It's well known by now that, for instance, in Britain, Russia had a very strong influence on the vote for Britain to separate from the rest of Europe, from the EU. And she discovered that Russia had given money to people, that these people had learned how to manipulate the public uh, in all kinds of ways. For example, if I want to persuade you that we should leave the EU, and I know you are, and Facebook tells me that you are interested in cruelty to animals or hostile to cruelty to animals. Uh, what I do is I start targeting adverts telling you about how much animal cruelty there is in Europe. If I wanna make you hostile to Korea, I will start giving you information about animal cruelty in Korea, you know. Look at the stories coming out of the Ukraine now when you want to make people feel very sympathetic to the Ukraine. And they're all stories about how much people love their pets and how they take their pets everywhere and how they rescue kittens. Now, I'm not saying these things are not true, but I'm saying that they can be used to target people. In Britain, elderly people are targeted a lot in this way. That people come to them and say, oh, why don't you adopt a donkey, adopt a an animal, you know, look after this adopter bear. We do the adopter bear thing in Hong Kong. I'm not saying these are bad things, but people use them for other motives. So Carol Kudwalada uh, was very nervous about public speaking. I want to show you this. She is nervous. You can see she's nervous, but watch how she gets over it. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but watch how she gets over it. Now, I can tell she's nervous. She's not having a full-blown panic attack like Sam Harris did. But you can tell that she's, she's catching her breath. She's actually quite nervous to be in front of these people doing this presentation. She's rehearsed it enough, I think. She knows what she's doing. She's a journalist, but she's a print journalist. She's not a TV journalist. She's better at this now, but I can tell that when she gave this TED talk, she's quite nervous because she's actually just decided what I need to convince people about is so important that I'm going to stand up there and do it. She's, you know, she's pretty good. She's, she's, she, yes, she's nervous. You can see she's nervous. She, She's got this thing that she wants to put out. She's got this idea she wants to give to people, but she's willing to be nervous. She, uh, her, her phrasing is still very good. 
notice that I said story is can be very important and very useful. She begins this by telling you a story. You know, my editor told me to go to Wales. I went to Wales. I saw this. I saw that. I've been there before. I'm, I talked to people in the town. This is a story. Story comes into speeches a lot of the time, into presentations a lot of the time. If you are trying to sell a design to somebody, um, it's good to tell them a story. So, well, we were thinking that we would do this and then we thought about that. You don't just go into a very dry thing and sort of come go on, you know, jumping into in a very dry way. In the end, what she goes on to tell you is basically that they discovered that people were using very complicated forms of psychological manipulation on Facebook and they were using it um, by some of it was paid for with Russian money, that they were actually getting the information from Facebook about people's psychology, about people's interests, all these kind of things. So it gets to be a very complicated story, but she doesn't actually start off with that totally. So, you know, if you've got things you want to change in the world, if you've got things you want to push in the world, it's really worth um, learning to speak to stand up in front of people and speak. Again, I've talked a little bit, we're, going to, we're coming up to the end now, so this will probably be the, the last slide. I, I won't keep you too long because I kept people way past time last time I did this on one of the lectures. Um, public speaking. Now, th there's quite an interesting thing for me. I did say that communication is a two-way thing, but public speaking is still not a com conversation. There's a sort of artificiality about it. One of the things I felt in television was when I'm working in television was I actually started this program in RTHK called In Conversation because I wanted to do a program where we talk to people who were quite famous or quite well known in some way or other. And I wanted it to be a conversation. Usually, television is like television interviews are like police investigating a subject. You know, it's like, uh, so tell me, uh, where were you at Wednesday at 7.30? And what did you do next? Now, this kind of thing never, we don't have conversations like this, unless you suspect your boyfriend or girlfriend of cheating on you or something. We don't have conversations like this. This is not a conversation. A conversation is more of a two-way thing. Now, um, but there is still an element of conversation, even in a public speaking context, because like I said, I am listening to you. If you, if you think my jokes are lame, I will tell you fewer jokes. If I see you, everybody's yawning, I will actually try and liven things up a bit. If I see everybody is sitting there, I went to visit a winery a few years ago and the guy was giving us a speech about making wine. And he said, oh, you lot, you, 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 you people, you, you obviously not liking what I'm saying to you. He said, you're all standing there with your arms like this, which usually is taken as a sign that you're blocking out what the person's trying to tell you. You're actually putting up a resistance to the ideas they're trying to put into your head. So if I look out in my audience and my whole audience is sitting there like this, I'm, I'm, I, I'm gonna have to redouble my efforts. So it's not a conversation in the sense that I chat, you chat, I chat, you chat. It's a conversation in the sense that I talk, you talk as the presenter and the communication comes back to you as nonverbal messages from the audience. So in terms of presenting, you, have, you can think very much about, about, you know, how can I pay attention to nonverbal messages? Now, again, for the purpose of a short exercise and over Zoom, this may not be so key, but in a more complex situation in real life, when you're doing this in front of a room full of people, in front of 500 people, say, um, you will be able to pick up on these things and you will be able to go from there. Anyway, uh, 
we'll talk a little bit more about that next week and talk a little bit more about responding to people, getting interaction. Uh, it's five o'clock now, coming up to five o'clock, and some people may have other classes to go to, I don't know. Um, so I'll stop here for now and uh, I'll carry on next week. Next week we'll talk more specifically about delivery and about writing for, for present presentation and even about using your voice more effectively in terms of presentation. So I'll see you then and carry on a bit more then. Well, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, that's very interesting. Um, so any questions from our audience at the moment? I think there are lots of points to take. So you can write it down here on the chat function. So um, you can turn your microphone on. <laughs> I think they're quite shy. <laughs> yeah, no, we probably get, you know, we probably get more response maybe next week when we get into more specific details about the presenting on the on the ground, as it were. Yes, 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 I guess so. Um, yeah, then next week we'll put the, uh, the topics about writing and also the delivery uh, skills. So I think what that will be a little bit more... Uh, functional or more practical for you guys uh, if you, you have a lot of uh, presentations or project presentations coming up. So please uh, use the same Zoom link next week. Uh, time is a little bit different. We will have it on the next Wednesday uh, at 11 a.m. to 12.30. Uh, so we change a little bit of the timing. So stay put. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always send me an email. So, uh, Jasper, okay. So, I guess to say thank you. So, um, thank you very much for your coming, for your attentions. Um, I hope to see you guys again next week. So if you have uh, no other questions, um, then I will see you next week then. Um, the video will be put on our website, so for your later um, viewing.